So before we get started, just a few quick reminders from Netroots. Um, please, if you're able, um, just stay masked while in conference spaces and not actively eating and drinking. And make sure to please keep the aisles and any marked accessibility spaces open and clear for folks that may need them. Um, and without further ado, I know we have folks still trickling in, um, but we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to Expanding Justice Organizing to Reform the Supreme Court. I wonder why we are talking about this today. <laughs> um, so what I'll do is I'll give a brief overview of just why it is that we're here. We'll dive into the conversation, and if time permits, um, we'll try to reserve about 10 to 15 minutes towards the end um, for questions from the audience. So please feel free to collect those questions, hold on to them, and we will do our best to get to as many of you um, at the end. But before we do that, um, I want to go ahead and start with a quick round of introductions. I know that some, if not all of these folks, may not need intros, um, but out of respect, um, I think that it's necessary to just kind of go down the line and talk about who it is that we have here. Um, I'll start first by introducing myself. My name is Tristan Brown. I'm the Policy and Program Director at People's Parity Project, uh, which is a nationwide network of lawyers and law students organizing against the corporate and conservative capture of our courts. Sitting directly next to me, we have Brett Atkins, who is the Managing Director of Policy and Political Affairs at Stand Up America, which is a grassroots community that's standing up to corruption and voter suppression and building a more representative democracy. Next to Brett, we have Representative Greg Kassar, who represents Texas's 35th District, um, who's also the whip of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Um, next to Representative Kassar, we have Mershed Zahid, who is a senior advisor for Take Back the Court, whose mission is to inform the public about the danger that the Supreme Court poses to democracy and about the viability of court expansion, adding seats to the court as the only strategy that rebalances the court after its 2016 theft. And last, but certainly not least, <laughs> we have Representative Pramila Jayapal, who represents Washington's 7th District. Yeah. Clap it up. Um, and she is the chairwoman of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Um, so before we dive in, like I said, just a quick overview. Um, we are kind of short out of another horrific term um, from the Supreme Court. And in just two terms, a lot has happened. Um, as many of you already know, um, in those two terms, we've seen this court take away the constitutional right to abortion, dramatically curb the EPA's ability to regulate our wetlands, waterways, and climate-related issues, greenlight discrimination against LGBTQ plus people in the public square, outlaw affirmative action and higher education admissions processes, and strike down President Biden's student debt relief plan. For the next term, we've already gotten the preview that the court has decided to take up the issue of whether domestic abusers can own guns. So I think that there's this pattern um, or this common denominator that we kind of see of this court making these affirmative decisions to take up cases that they know um, will have impacts on millions of us in this country. Um, and because they are just this body of nine unelected, unaccountable people, they have the, the ability and the authority, quite frankly, to take up any of these cases and kind of, as as we've seen recently, decide them even if that decision is not really based in logic or law. Um, so probably not the biggest surprise, but confidence in this right-wing court is at an all-time low, with Gallup showing that only 25% of Americans think that this court is doing a good job. That sinking public approval and the egregious decisions coming from the court have advanced calls, efforts, and most importantly, the opportunity to organize around bringing about structural reforms. In fact, multiple polls have shown a growing majority of Americans believe that the court not only has too much power, um, but that Americans also are in support of rebalancing this court through expansion specifically. While not a new concept, we know that expansion has not always been a part of the mainstream conversation, and that it's taken many of us some time to get on board, and others are still considering whether it's a worthwhile pursuit. So with that all being said, I want to kind of dive in, and I'll start uh, with Representative Jayapal. Um, as the chairwoman of the largest caucus in Congress, you've been a leader and out front on a lot of progressive issues. Can you just share with us a little bit about what your journey towards being vocal about this Supreme Court has looked like and what led you to ultimately embrace Supreme Court expansion? Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Tristan, and thank you so much for your work and to all of these incredible panelists and to all of you that are in the room here today and know how important this is. I think for me, I am an, <clears throat> I am an 
infrastructure person. I'm an institution. Uh, I'm, I think about institutions and how they allow us to do the things that we want, you know. And so in my last thing, I talked about rules and rulers. And there are things, there are structures that exist that don't allow us to do the things that we want to do. And we have to identify them. And so I don't think I thought about the Supreme Court that way when I first came in, because I think many of us are used to thinking about the Supreme Court as an arbiter of justice, the ultimate arbiter of justice, and maybe we disagree sometimes and we agree sometimes, but I don't think we've necessarily understood how much power the Supreme Court has to really shift even our legislative victories, um, to shift precedent. I think there was this idea that you had precedent and then that was a fight that was won, you know, like, like Roe or uh, voting rights or some of these things that we're see seeing overturned. And certainly legislatively, I don't think we had any notion of how a court could start to really weigh in and ensure that even what we passed legislatively um, could, be, could be hurt. But I think when I got in and I saw, and I got in unfortunately right at the same time that Donald Trump came in, um, and saw the way in which they utilized the court, they utilized not just the Supreme Court, but the federal bench as well, you know, really moving appointments, and um, realized that this was a very, very organized, long-term organized event or, or movement to radicalize the Supreme Court. To me, it then became clear that you can't count on this institution as it is. You have to reform it. And so that's why I've been a strong, ch and I'm on the Judiciary Committee, so we had a lot of deep diving into this. But that's why I support expanding the court, not an unprecedented thing to have done at all. Um, I support term limits. I support other kinds of reforms that will bring the institution back into uh, the place where it actually matches what people expect or believe the Supreme Court to be. I just do think we have a lot of education to do, and so I'm glad to be on this panel for that. And I'm glad that you're on this panel with us to talk about it. Um, similarly, for you, Representative Kassar, you're best known for your work as an intersectional labor organizer, um, and you're a little bit newer to Congress, but you kind of come in hot, especially in supporting expansion specifically. And so just curious about what that journey for you has looked like, if it's been quite the journey or if it was like a really e easy decision for you to make. Yeah, I, uh, well, first off, when I started this at Roots, <laughs> good to see all of you. Um, I, you know, I started out working on immigration issues and seeing the ways that uh, big money oftentimes wanted to see uh, extract immigrant workers labor but not give people equal rights. Or on climate issues and we saw how big polluters and big corporations wanted to trample on workers and on their communities and future, further the climate crisis in order to profit. Um, or on labor issues as a labor organizer and seeing again how working people could organize to demand more, but oftentimes in Texas, uh, bought off politicians would try to lower wages and lower benefits. And I see the Supreme Court fight actually in the exact same vein, where we used to have a Supreme Court uh, that actually tried to protect people's rights or advance those rights rather than trample on them. Uh, it was actually a 20-something year old lawyer, Sarah Weddington, who is buried in my district from Austin, who had never taken a case to trial before, decided to sue Dallas District Attorney Henry Wade and took that case up to the Supreme Court. Nobody thought she would win, and she brought abortion rights to the country with the case Roe v. Wade. Uh, that was something that was won from Texans. Uh, it was similarly many voting rights cases coming out of Texas and a Texas president that so signed the Voting Rights Act into law. So we used to have this kind of institution where when people came together, uh, and saw an injustice, they could use either a democracy or, um, or also coming forward to the court to advance people's interests. And I s started to see that actually big money came and flooded into that court to make sure that they turned the clock back. Uh, and so to me, now that we live in a, in a state where you used to have an abortion clinic in my district right up the street and now folks have to travel to Wichita, Kansas, hundreds if not thousands of miles, and you ask yourself how it is that, that that happened, it's that we no longer have a court, we have a super legislature is what we were talking about. They are making their lifetime appointed folks that were supposed to be justices, but in many ways are actually taking votes, changing the law, making decisions, and they were put there by right-wing money that wanted to basically turn 
the sanctuary of abortion rights into a graveyard of reproductive health. They wanted to turn a place that used to advance people's voting rights um, into a place that is actually just allowing tons of corporate money to make decisions through things like Citizens United. And so if we recognize that the Supreme Court is not this um, sacrosanct institution, but is instead something where the right wing have, has poured tons of money into making sure that it can override what the majority of people want, then obviously the answer is we have to do something about it now. We can't just sit on our hands and let them keep on running the show because that's too often I think what happens in democratic politics is we focus on policies or passing this or that bill while right-wing money actually ends up deciding the bigger terms of the debate and we have to stop letting that happen. Yeah, I think that's completely right. Um, and I think in terms of advocates and a lot of advocacy groups, um, you know, a lot of them are still kind of considering those those implications and those factors and determining whether expansion specifically is something that they can support. And so I think it would be incredibly useful to hear from our advocates and their perspectives um, about just kind of what led you both to embrace Supreme Court expansion and your respective organizations. So Brett, if you don't mind, we'll start with you. Sure. I mean, organizationally, uh, at Stand Up America, we're a national progressive organization with two million members around the country. And our mission is about breaking down structural barriers to progress, building a more representative democracy, building power in communities of color and marginalized communities. And the court has become the barrier to all of that uh, through the Shelby County decision, through Brnovich, uh, embracing partisan gerrymandering, uh, allowing an unlimited supply of money to enter our politics through Citizens United. So if we wanna do our mission, you can't ignore the court anymore and we can't keep just fighting for legislation if it's just gonna be struck down by these legislators in black robes. Uh, personally, you know, I come, I think Merchette is, is similar. I went to law school. Law school makes you a kind of institutional conservative. Uh, you read all these cases, you get a little respect for the institution. I, had a, I have a lot of respect for this institution and want it to be apolitical, but that position was a lot easier to have in the 90s and the early aughts when it was a 5-4 court and the moderate was Sandra Day O'Connor, right. uh, who supported abortion rights, or even Justice Kennedy, who supported gay rights. And both of those justices believed in stare decisis and precedent and moving slowly. That's not the court we're dealing with anymore. This is a 6-3 supermajority, ultra-conservative. They legislate from the bench. They recklessly overturn precedent. And if we want to protect our fundamental rights, like Representative Kazar is talking about, we have to reform the court. So that's how I got on my journey, and organizationally, we changed positions as well. Marshad? Uh, sure, and I'll, I'll pick up where, where Brett left off, you know, as 26 years, 26 years ago when I was a 2L uh, in law school and in con law classes, never, I never imagined I would be here um, advocating for expanding the court. It, it just would blow my mind uh, at that point. And the reason I'm here is essentially three, I would say three inflection points. Uh, the first one happened uh, in November of 2000. Uh, was one of the attorneys um, who went down to West Palm Beach, Florida, taking depositions from hundreds of grandparent, uh, grandmas who said, Merced, I did not vote for that Nazi, Pat Buchanan. I just did it. Mm -hmm. I know exactly who I voted for. And we, we prepared for litigation, we took depositions, and we were convinced that law, rule of law was gonna prevail, and this, you know, in, uh, 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 the Supreme Court is gonna allow a recount go on and we're, we're gonna have President Al Gore elect and did not happen. That was sort of the first awakening in terms of, okay, this Supreme Court is not what I thought it was all, you know, all my life since I moved to US. But we went on. And the second inflection point came in 2016 uh, when President Barack Obama appointed Merrick Garland. And we saw what Mitch McConnell did. He essentially packed the court. And so that was the, se uh, that was the second moment. And then, it was the confirmation hearings of Brett Kavanaugh. And after Brett Ka Kavanaugh was ramped through, this, uh, uh, ramped through the um, Senate confirmation hearings, that's when I realized, okay, this is not sustainable. Uh, I'm an also, I, as a former Hill staffer, I see myself in, as an institutionalist as well. And I, and I said to myself, this is, this is not gonna work and we may not be able to fix it in my lifetime, but we gotta move and we gotta come up with solutions that make sense. And that's when um, my former colleague, Aaron Belkin from Take Back the Court and a couple of others reached out to me and said, Merced, what are you thinking? Have you, have you thought, you know, we, 
we think we should expand the court. And my first, my first question was, is it legal? And it's been done seven times. And I'm like, all right, let's go. Here we are. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> No, thanks, y'all, for um, just sharing those perspectives. I think, for me, it's been interesting. Um, before I got to law school, I think like most folks who thankfully don't go to law school, if you <laughs> have that opportunity to not make that decision, but <laughs> you, you just kind of like view the Supreme Court as this institution or just like this beacon of hope, but I think just kind of the radicalization, at least for me, was law school in a sense, but also afterwards, like all of the things that everyone has mentioned on the panel, just coming to the realization that in the aggregate, the court as an institution has been an institution that's been more regressive than not on the whole. Um, I think we think of the huge landmark cases, right, like Brown v. Board, Obergefell, Roe v. Wade, when that was a thing, um, about you know examples of how the court has helped to advance civil rights. But thinking about the fact that this is also the institution that codified or, you know, allowed things like Dred Scott yeah. or Korematsu um, and just everything that we're seeing more recently with this court, um, seeing that on the whole, the institution has been one that's kind of rolled back civil rights more than it has advanced those civil rights. Um, but when we think about court expansion specifically, one of the main counter arguments is this is such a radical proposal. And I just want to kind of like take a moment to like dissect that and talk about whether this is really that radical of a pro proposal. And so not to be like law professor style, but I'm going to cold call you first. <laughs> so we'll go with Brett to start us off. So glad you asked. Uh, the framers set up the Supreme Court, but left to Congress wide latitude to define its scope of jurisdiction and its size. You don't need a constitutional amendment to change the size of the Supreme Court. There's nothing magic about nine. Uh, when the Supreme Court first convened in 1790, there were six of them. Then there were five. Then uh, in the late Civil War era, they went up to 10 because they wanted to help Abe Lincoln end the war and end slavery. So the Republicans uh, added a seat so he could appoint anti-slavery Republican justices. Then uh, we now have nine. And then in 2016, we had eight. Uh, Mitch McConnell didn't say, I'm changing the size of the Supreme Court, but he did it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so we never had just nine. That is not the history of our country. Uh, and if anybody asks you who was the last president to expand the court, it was Abe Lincoln. The other thing I wanted to mention on the history is a lot of people tell Democrats you shouldn't do this because FDR tried to pack the court and it was a failure. That's not right. FDR tried to save the New Deal from a court that was striking down minimum wage laws and worker protections. And so he proposed expanding the court. And two months later, the court switched all of its jurisprudence and said, OK, New Deal, New Deal stuff is fine. This was the switch in time that saved nine. The court packing plan worked because it pressured the court to change its mind. He didn't need to pass the bill. We have a radical court today that's just as crazy and out of touch as it was in the 1930s. Uh, so, Anyone who says this is too radical, just read your history. Mm -hmm. Marshad, what about you? Um, and just a reminder for everyone, if you can talk straight into the, the mics um, so everyone can hear, that'd be appreciated. Thanks, y'all. Sure thing. So the American Declaration of Independence lays out a clear, uh, laid out a clear principle. Governments derive the legitimacy from the consent of the governed. The Supreme Court, as it is right now, violates this principle. Why? Republicans have controlled the Supreme Court for more than 50 years, even though they have lost seven of the last presidential elections in terms of popular votes. More than two-thirds of Americans today were not even born. Last time, there was a Supreme Court majority appointed by a Democratic president. A majority of the current a majority of the current court has been appointed by Republican presidents who first took office after losing the popular vote. They don't have consent. So, and if Congress does not take any action, we are going to have this right-wing majority dominating the court until 2065. And that's and that's not sustainable. If you combine with the structural biases that's inherent in electoral college and the United States Senate, 
that inherently favors Republicans in the small states. This court's current supermajority means, the 6-3 supermajority means, which is essentially, essentially functioning like a super legislature, uh, it, 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 they're going to dominate unless we take reasonable steps swiftly, like expanding the court, which has been done seven times. Yeah, uh, representatives Jayapal and Kassar, um, I know both of you are co-sponsors of the Judiciary Act, and for folks who are not familiar with that piece of legislation, very simply put, it would immediately add four justices to the Supreme Court. Curious for you all's thoughts on whether expansion is just this really, really radical idea. No, I don't think it's radical at all. I think it's still perceived as radical, so part of what we have to do is change that. That's why we're all here, to learn about you know how do we make sure how do we talk about this and part of the challenge is particularly in the senate where you have people who have been in that institution for 30 years this is true of the filibuster i also think it's true of court expansion because people still have this way of thinking about these institutions as you know, part of why we're, you know, we're, we're a moderate country, we moderate the influences, all of those things that kind of come with having served for a long time when perhaps the Supreme Court, I mean, it wasn't perfect, you've heard that, but perhaps it was a little better. It was, try, it was trying to move forward in, in major ways versus move backwards. In the House, I think that, um, you know, part of, part of the challenge of legislating, Moshed knows this, Greg certainly knows it from just even being in the minority, uh, you have to get a certain threshold in order for the rest to come on. And we're not at that threshold. I think we have like 30 co-sponsors or 34, I forget what the number is right now. Um, and so what we would like to do, and in the last session, we had so much that we had to get accomplished that this, we did have a hearing on the Judiciary Act. We had several hearings on Supreme Court ethics as well. You know, Elizabeth Warren and I have a great bill on Supreme Court ethics and transparency. Um, Hank Johnson has a bill on that as well. So we're trying to educate even our own members um, but it's important for them to hear this from you and to make the arguments for why it isn't radical. I think uh, what Brett and Murshed have been saying is really important. This has been done before. Congress has the power to do this. This is not Congress stepping into an area that is not ours. This is absolutely within our legislative authority. And um, when you hear the arguments about court packing and this is going to make it too partisan and all of those things, what you have to say is that at the end of the day, these Supreme Court justices still have to be confirmed through the Senate. There is still a process for that to happen. And that process is inherently more conservative than probably anyone in this room would like. So I think those are the arguments that we have to make. But it's, it's I would say we're sort of more at the beginning, I think this Roberts court has made it, frankly, much easier for us to make these arguments because they are so radical and they are doing things that not even those institutionalists could imagine, right? So everyone's having a moment like Brett or Moshed or even for me thinking about Clarence Thomas actually going back was like a big, the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill hearings were also a big moment for me to say, wait a second, a court an institution is just made up of the people who are in that institution. So how are we letting these people in? And then, of course, Merrick Garland and all of that that happened. We're not letting in those people, and we're using weird legislative ways to block that from happening. So that's the work that we have to do, and that's why I'm really happy to see a, a, a good packed room here and also to have experts um, who are able to come in. We just did a a session at the Congressional Progressive Caucus with Sheldon Whitehouse, Senator Whitehouse, and with uh, Brian Fallon from Demand Justice, just to try to explain to people some of the different pieces of this, and we're just gonna continue to do that work and make sure that we educate our members, and hopefully they'll hear from you as well, to get on that bill. This is a way um, that we need to move forward if we're gonna make any progress on, on any of the issues that we care about. Representative Kassar. I'd say, you know, the the greatest trick the devil ever pulled is like making it seem like the status quo is what's normal and the things we want to change are radical rather than that our existing reality is really radical, right? And so, so many people 
in our communities know that it is really radical and crazy that kids are having to do all of these um, uh, shooter drills and that in states like Texas, li uh, licenseless carry and permitless gun carry and open carry of rifles and that gun manufacturers have more rights than our kids. That seems actually when you talk to folks like a really, that's a ra radical status quo. And what folks want is just for kids to be able to be safe. Well, if you want that, then we have to say, if you want uh, our kids to have more rights than gun manufacturers, then we have to expand the court, right? We have to finish making that connection. If we want women to have more of a say over their bodies than right-wing politicians, then we have to expand the Supreme Court for people to recognize that these everyday, um, that the everyday radical reality that we're seeing right-wing officials push is directly linked to the court, I think is that connection that it is that we need to make. And I think, as Pramila was saying, that there is a tipping, right now, court expansion is only a minority of our caucus. But there is a tipping point where it can then become the standard democratic position. I remember when I was uh, helping fast food workers strike and we were asking for $15 in a union that we were called like this very fringy thing. Uh, and now it's like a, a standard thing. Like, who are you if you aren't for 15 in a union? 15, you know, we're, I think we're now asking for at least 17 or 18 as the minimum 22. wage. 22. 22. Well, what it, I'm asking for. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, we just passed 20 for uh, all contracts uh, in Austin, which is, I think, higher than any other city's done. Um, but my, so my sense is we have to get started here um, as this kind of group, and then for community members and neighbors to say, if, you, if your representative cares about gun safety, then they should be caring about expanding the court. If they care about reproductive freedom, they should care about expanding the court. If they care about the climate crisis, because what, what would be worse than us getting majorities in the House and Senate and getting a bill to the president's desk uh, to codify Roe or to tackle um, massive carbon pollution and then to have the Supreme Court deny it after all of that work, right? right? And so we have to end gerrymandering and Citizens United, expand the court and have the kinds of rules that make it so that the people can govern. And I just want to kind of pick up on that connecting these issues to the court directly piece. I think that's really, really important and a big piece of how we've seen that public perception of the court shifting quite a bit in a relatively short period of time. Um, a lot of these cases that I kind of went over have you know, also led to a lot of mainstream or non-radical groups, or I don't know, maybe people still perceive them as radical, but more established legacy groups coming out in support of expansion. More recently, we've seen groups like NARAL, Planned Parenthood, um, SEIU, um, National Action Network, March for Our Lives, all of these groups who are, you know, who were once like, I don't know about it, but now kind of shifting to realizing like we're just at a place where this court is really untenable and there seems to be no other way to really move forward. But to kind of stick on the counter arguments piece, um, another big point that comes up um, when we kind of throw court expansion out there to folks who are not necessarily on board yet is, well, if we do it, then wouldn't the Republicans just do the same thing when they get the opportunity or when they're in power? And so I'm not going to cold call anyone this time. If anybody wants to jump at the, the bit, though, to, to answer the question in terms of how you respond to a counter argument like that, please feel free to jump in. I mean, how much worse can it get? I mean, right, like that, <laughs> right? I mean, seriously, but it is us thinking, okay, ideally, what size would we want the court to be in some ideal world? And we were saying, yeah, in the ideal world, I'd love to be in Congress and say, what tinkering should we make to our universal and free healthcare system, ideally, right? But we don't live in that world. We live in a world where abortion is banned in every state in the South except for Virginia. Like, like we, we, we have to recognize that it, we can't let them just keep rolling us like this. We have to be able to fight back. And if we keep holding back, that's gonna keep sending us down the path that we're on. And so the only logical response in the short term that I've been able to hear from anyone um, that doesn't basically say we have to sacrifice the next 30 or 40 years to right-wing rule is court expansion. It's the only argument that I've heard. In that way, it's actually the only moderate decision we can make. And I would just add to that, um the political argument here, because we get this argument also on the filibuster, 
and getting rid of the filibuster, it's the same argument. Well, if we get rid of the filibuster, then they can just use that to their advantage and we'll lose. Well, guess what, people? We're losing now. That's right. Yeah. And if we don't start winning, yeah. right? If we don't start winning, people will lose even more faith in our ability to make any change happen. And that's why even when we talk about the court, I talk about the filibuster because we can't expand the court legislatively unless we get rid of the filibuster because we need 60 votes otherwise. And on all this stuff, we just have to be really clear about what the, what the steps are to get here. And, you know, with... Um, with the argument that they could do the same thing, that is only true if they get back the majority, right? So if we have the majority and we get rid of the filibuster, expand the court, then we will be able to show people that we are doing things that match their expectations because the whole thing about this is most of what we do in Congress is a decade behind where the American people are. And so if we can keep up with where people actually are, um, then we will keep them with us, and they won't take back the majority. So, and listen, we have a simple majority in the House, and I think we've done pretty damn well in the House when we've had power. And they haven't rolled it back, because once you pass something, and people like it, they don't want to get rid of it. So I just think we have to really knock that argument down and make it clear how deeply in trouble we are, what a crisis our democracy is in, the fascism we face, all of those things um, that, that really mean that if we don't make these fundamental reforms, we will continue to go down that path and we won't have the opportunity to come back. Well, I think you I, I think you made this point to me the first time, which is like so much of our agenda requires us to do things. And I've seen so much just in my first few terms in, or first few months in Congress, how the Republican agenda is to break things. Right. And so they don't actually need to get rid of the filibuster to break things. They already have a majority on the on the Supreme Court to break things. And so if we are actually if we want to do something with guns, we have to pass something. If we want to raise wages, we have to pass something. If we want to protect trans folks, we have to pass stuff and do things. Um, and so the, the filibuster or Supreme Court that blocks things only really helps those folks that want to rip us apart. That's right. Exactly. I think it's, uh, it's worth uh, talking about this uh, point more because we hear this a lot. And I break it down in a few things. And, and it's, re it's worth repeating. Republicans have already done this. It's not a matter of whether they're going to do it. They have, they're the ones who have actually packed the court. They did it in 2016 by, as Brett uh, said, shrinking the court size to eight. And then they did it again in 2020 when Mitch McConnell broke his own rule by ramming through uh, Amy Coney Barrett's uh, nomination with RBG die. So they have done this. So the second thing that you want to think about, I think, you know, in terms of game theories, game theories say forget about it, right? In terms of the best way to discourage this kind of legislative strong-arming tactics, I have more colorful words, but I want to be res <laughs> respectful uh, of uh, the amazing uh, members here, is um, you need a proportionate response. And right now, expansion and rebalancing this court is a proportionate response to what these guys have done. And there's another benefit to expanding the court. If you expand and rebalance the court and have a pro-democracy court, chances are you're, that's going to open the door to more democracy reforms, right? And that will disincentivize the kind of behavior we have seen from Republicans from the last 30, 40 years. And lastly, I feel like this, uh, this question also assumes, makes an assumption that's fundamentally wrong. The, the question, the what if the Republicans do this? The question is, if the Republicans regain a trifecta, right, and they, elim uh, 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 they eliminate the filibuster, they're going to, uh, uh, and that they would, they, the, the, the question assumes that the Republicans will not do this if they re uh, regain the White House if uh, they regain the Senate and the House, and, and if their uh, shoe was on the other foot, there was a 6-3 liberal majority or a 5-4 liberal majority, oh, hell yes, they would absolutely do it. They would do it in a heartbeat. Yep. 
They don't care. They, they don't have need so many panels. Yeah, they won't they need, they won't need so many panels. You know, they they would do this in a heartbeat because of their uh, thirst for power. Brett, did you want to add anything? Everybody said everything. Um, so I want to kind of just go back to this this notion of Congress always kind of being a step behind the American people. Um, I think last year when the Dobbs decision came out, we saw how that was a huge motivator to get voters to the polls. Um, and then obviously this term, we've seen the court issue even more conservative opinions, and we'll see how that plays out at the polls. But I'm curious, um, and I'd like to start out with our representatives, but also want to hear from our advocates as well. Are we seeing the emergence of like this SCOTUS voting block on the left? Is that something that, in terms of messaging, we should be catering to to voters to really drive them to the polls? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely think so. I think it's a very energizing and motivating idea for um, people across the country for our base. And I think that, again, I think we don't explain stuff enough. And I think we promise things very well-intentioned. I think I've even done this before I fully understood the, uh, the, the block of the filibuster. I mean, I'm like pretty politically educated, but I don't think I fully understood the filibuster until I got to Congress. And then I was like, oh, no wonder we've been losing everything. <laughs> We can't do it. We gave 40 senators the ability to, who represent 11% of the population, to be able to block everything. So I think that the court is a perfect way to bring in our base who are really frustrated with the fact that stuff doesn't work, that we're taking steps backward, and to, as Greg said in the very beginning, connect it back to the issue that they care about, climate change. Look at what they did with the Clean Water Act. I mean, this is like crazy, the stuff that they're doing. Look at what they care about labor rights. Look at what they're doing on collective bargaining. Um, you know, abortion, of course, we know. I think that's been very successfully shown. But there is probably a direct link. Because this is such an activist legislating court, there is a direct link to whatever issue the people that you're talking to care about. So absolutely, I think this is a really motivating factor and we should keep pushing it and keep talking about it and also use the bill as an organizing tool. And I hope we can talk about that too because we have 103 members of the Progressive Caucus. I can't remember what the co-sponsorship total is. I think it's 30 or 34. We have a lot of work to do. So um, we have about uh, over 60 co-sponsors on the Judiciary Act, three senators, and the rest are House of Representative uh, members. And then I think you're right in terms of CPC folks um, yeah. that it's about a third of that um, with with the the House of Representatives who are co-sponsors. And you need 218 votes to pass anything in the House. So, you know, we've got our work to do. But I think this is a great a great issue for us politically, electorally, and certainly morally. I, I'd add just, I already covered a little bit of this ground, but most often in our communities, in our districts, people say, well, what are we doing about student debt? Or what is it that we're going to do about universal health care or gerrymandering? They don't often ask, what are we doing about the court? And so I do, and so oftentimes we can respond, oh, I have a bill on this, or I have a bill on that, and then, you know, everybody's done. And so I do think it requires people asking the follow-up question, well, what about the court on it? So I do think for us to shift and for there to be this tipping point amongst members of the House, it's really important for folks in the community to say, hey, I care about gun safety or I care about the climate crisis, and so we need to do something about the court. Uh, I think that question has to start getting asked both by us on the House side and in the community if we want to get to the place where we're at 218. And I do think we're headed quickly in that direction. I mean, we have more co-sponsors uh, this term than ever before, but I do think it requires that awareness and that, and that kind of advocacy. I would just add, I mean, on the progressive side, so I mean, for decades, the right has had voters who are voting on the Supreme Court because of abortion. Um, that is, now they've accomplished their goal, and we're starting to see election results in places like Kansas and elsewhere, people are turning out in droves because of the Supreme Court. Um, I can also say, as, as somebody who works in a progressive organization, the action rates that we see internally are phenomenal on this issue. Uh, the anger that you see is unexpected when you talk about something as wonky as adding four justices to the court. Uh, we see digital ad performances that are mind-blowing. Uh, we've had our members, who are two million around the country, they've sent over half a million emails. They've sent made over 10,000 calls. They've 
sent in 31,000 letters to the editor of their local papers. They've been published in every state. Um, we don't see that on every issue, and certainly not on an issue this wonky. So just anecdotally, I see it, and then in the election results, we're seeing it. So it'll take a couple cycles, I think, to make it clear there's a SCOTUS voting block, but we're seeing it. Yeah, I will, I will go. I mean, I mean, I'll provide a little bit of a historical perspective because I feel like an internet grandpa <laughs> when, I, when I come to Netroots Nation. Um, when I, I left the Senate in 2009, and as soon as I left the Senate, I left with a really bad taste in my mouth in, uh, seeing what the Republicans were doing to the Democratic majority that came in in 2006. They were essentially filibustering bill after bill after bill. My uh, ex-boss, Senator Harry Reid, used to just say, you know, they're just filibustering on steroids. It's ridiculous. And so it was around 2010, we first, it was, about four or five organizations started the sort of the uh, reforming the filibuster movement, and it was really lonely at that time. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it was it was actually <laughs> got folks here from Netroots, Daily Coast, and like maybe like three to five organizations in D.C. and a couple of U.S. senators. That's it, and it, that effort took you know millions of petitions, hundreds of thousands of phone calls to. Uh, over a 13-year period to where it is today, which is it is essentially the unanimous, almost the unanimous position in the Senate Democratic Caucus that yes, we need to reform the filibuster. And I actually think, in relation to that, um, the movement to reform, expand the court, you know, thanks to the effort of I'm going to say my brilliant colleagues that take back the court, Stand Up America, and uh, People's Parity Project. The progress is actually remarkable. I, th I think Congresswoman Jayapal and the P uh, uh, CPC deserves a lot of credit. 60 plus electeds just after two years is nothing to sneeze at. That is a substantial power block and sub it's something substantial to build on. Uh, and on and on the Senate side, you have three senators who are pretty amazing. Uh, you know, you have Senator. Um, Ed, uh, at Markey, uh, Tina Smith from Minnesota, and the amazing Elizabeth Warren, who has come out and laid out a clear case for expanding the court. And, and I think that's a lot of momentum, amazing amount of, of momentum to build on. And I'm going to, and with like one note, I come from California, and there's a big Senate race that's going there with three amazing I am, I am, by the way, an undecided voter. I, I, I'm one of those undecided Iowa voters, but this time I'm an undecided California voter. You know, come caucus me. But um, all three of them, Adam Schiff, Katie Porter, and Barbara Lee, have come out for court expansion, not just in lip service. They are extremely effective advocates for it. They are advocating for it in all channels, in their emails, in their... Uh, TV appearances and in person. So, which is probably going to, you know, when one of them gets in, I'm just going to put Alex Padilla on the spot. He's going to have no excuse to uh, to not come out for it. So, so there is a lot of momentum there. I think the energy here is palpable, and I, you know, that's that's we got to build on that. Yeah, uh, Marchette, I'm glad you brought that up. I think it's a great segue to kind of pivot to the Senate. Um, obviously, in the House, we've seen a lot of exciting momentum on this bill specifically. Um, and three senators out of the Democratic caucus, while we are thrilled to have them supporting, is a little low. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I'm glad you brought up that example, Marchette, about just like straight up asking Senator Padilla, you know, when given the opportunity, like, where do you stand on this? But I'd just be curious um, to hear from all of you if you have the answers, you probably may not, because I don't know what the answer is, but what would it take or what should it take to at least drive those numbers up on the Senate side specifically? You know, we had Dobbs come out, and for a lot of us, that felt like that was going to be the camel that broke the up. Uh, the straw that broke the camel's back um, to see just kind of like this momentum really, really pick up on this bill specifically. Um, and we're still kind of like at this standstill, at least on the Senate side. So I'd be interested to hear, you know, what if anything we can or should be doing, especially for folks in this room, um, to encourage senators specifically to hop on this bill. Well, um, one of the things that I realized when I came in six years ago, it's only been six years, but um, is, that they don't 
organized on the Senate side as much. Elizabeth Warren is a phenomenal organizer. Um, Tina Smith, I think, is a is a really great organizer. But progressives on the Senate side tend to not organize there, and so we started working to organize them and to um, organize with them. Um, and I think that there is, I, I think we should think about, because I do think about like, what are what is the infrastructure we need to be successful with something, right? And is there a way to build something similar to the Progressive Caucus in the Senate where, or maybe we just expand to the Senate, um, but it's very, di it's a very different culture over there. Mushed knows this much better than I do, but I, I really, it, it is, it is really like everyone is a universe unto themselves. And um, when you have one person on a bill, it do, they don't go around and like try to get other people on the bill. It's just like, this is my bill, I'm on it, great. If somebody else comes on because you all tell them to, um, then maybe they do. And so I think that is just something to keep in mind and to think about how we organize around this. Now, I also think that we should have like two or three organizing tools leading up to the next election. Um, one, of course, is the bill itself, but maybe there should be a series of forums or fora around Supreme Court expansion, right? Um, I know that there, you know, there are, there's a tour around the country talking about this. There's other things that are happening, but we should settle on a couple of places um, where we can really push the message out. And then third, we have an election coming up perfect opportunity to get people on the record on this topic. And so let's seed and bird dog, um, you know, people that we think are important to get on the bill um, a, as we go into this next election. But I think we need a, and I know you all are doing this already and just hearing about um, the numbers of emails and people and the, you know, the, the energy behind people responding on this is just so great because, because we're seeing it right there in person, right, with, with Dobbs and with all these other things. Anybody else want to add? I will add to that. I think and there, uh, what uh, Congressman Jayapal just said about getting Senate candidates on the record, um, if you're coming from a place like Maryland, there's a Senate race there, and that's a huge opportunity to get the candidates there on record and see will you come out for expansion. That way, when, when um, the person comes into the U.S. Senate, you have, you have somewhat of a champion there. There is also a Senate race that's happening in Delaware where we're going to have a Democrat mm -hmm. from there as well. So there's another opportunity to get um, um, a Democrat on the record. And maybe we'll have Senators Jayapal and Kassar someday, <laughs> and they'll make the job easier. And if I can just say, ask him, get him on the record about the filibuster and court expansion, exactly. okay? Because really, really important. <laughs> Murshed is, is more optimistic than I am about the level of support for eliminating the filibuster in the Senate, because I think a lot of people kind of hid behind two yep. senators yep. Um, to not really be on the record about eliminating it. And I think we should eliminate it, not just reform it, because um, we really need, there's so many different pieces we need to get here. 100%. Yeah. The only thing I would, would add is that there's an opportunity in the Senate right now to remind senators of their constitutional obligation to act as a co-equal branch of government. The ethics scandal surrounding Justice Alito and especially Justice Thomas has opened a window into passing ethics, ethics legislation, hearings. They should be subpoenaing uh, the Chief Justice Roberts, Harlan Crow. Uh, our team is calling him Yacht Daddy, Harlan Crow. <laughs> uh, he should be hauled before the committee. And right. remember that they have an oversight responsibility. I think that that muscle memory on the Senate side has atrophied a little bit. They are very focused about nominations and approving judges. Uh, that's great but they also have a constitutional responsibility to act as a co-equal branch, so they gotta exercise that muscle. Yeah, um, on the topic of just congressional action, it has been wonderful to just see a lot of groups and people coalesce around a lot of different court reform measures. Obviously, we've seen term limits being thrown out there. Um, there seems to be a new ethics scandal plaguing the court nearly every day. And if anybody, just by the way, has a vacancy on a private jet, let me know. <laughs> I, I would not be opposed. Um, and, you know, Representative Jaya Paul, you brought up your ethics bill with Senator Warren, which PPP is really happy to endorse as well. Um, I'd also just like to hear, in light of all of that, why it's still so important and just like why expansion remains like this critical piece of the puzzle in addition to all of these additional uh, measures being advanced. 
I mean, I just think expansion is the right solution. I think, you know, term limits is absolutely interesting. I'm interested in that idea. I think it's, a, it, it's an important reform. When I came in at the CPC, I think Bernie Sanders was chair of the CPC for 15 years. Um, I came in and instituted term limits because I think it's good to have, you know, new leaders coming up and, and, and taking over leadership. And so I just, I think that's important, but I don't think that that fundamentally... Um, shifts the problems with how the court is already stacked. And I don't think it gets us to a longer term solution of making the court actually rep be, be at the size that it can represent the views of the people. So, so to me, I'm, I'm all for court reforms but, uh, of many different kinds. Um, I do think Elizabeth and my Supreme Court ethics bill is really excellent, and um, I realized I was mixing up the co-sponsorships. I think we've only got 30 or 32 co-sponsors on that ethics bill, and it's you're right, it's 60 on on the uh, on the Judiciary Act. Anyway, I, I just think those are all important. We shouldn't like eliminate one, but I do think that focusing on court ref uh, court reform through court expansion is the most um, sensible long-term solution for what we face. Yeah, I mean, in my view, I'm for uh, uh, term limits on the court, obviously for ethics reform of the court, but who's to say that this court wouldn't just strike down the term limits or the ethics rules or not follow subpoenas or say the term limits apply to the new folks but not to us? Um, and so uh, since expansion, as you both laid out so clearly, has been done so many times before and clearly falls within our authority, to me that's just a critical starting point that we have to stay focused on um, and I'm somewhat skeptical of saying like, well, I'm for these other ones and maybe I'll get to expansion someday. To me, to me expansion really has clearly been where the starting point has to be um, for us to then be able to do all these other key democracy reforms that we need to get done. Other folks want to add anything? Great. Not great. I'd love to hear from you all. Um, but <laughs> the final question that I have for you all, I think we've kind of touched on just things that people can do, um, but I want to just close it out if there are any additional ideas that you all have about what our everyday folks who are really concerned about this issue, um, who really care about creating this multiracial democracy that we all, at least in this space, um, you know, are striving to achieve, what is it that they can do to like really press on this issue? I can give a really easy one. Uh, if you are not making calls to your representative, they might not be one of these 60. <laughs> Uh, you can take out your phone, you can text the word court to 63033. Uh, Stand Up America will send you a tool. In two clicks, you will have sent your representative an email saying you need to be a co-sponsor of the Judiciary Act. And then from there, there's a bunch of other tools if you want to push the Senate to do investigations of Thomas and pass an ethics bill and other things. Um, but get involved. Uh, it's still a minority of the Democratic caucus, still only half of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. There's a lot of room to grow. So if you're one of those people who doesn't make calls because your representative is a dem Democrat and you think they're already on board, they might not be. 63033, just text the word court. And as you mention how many how much engagement you've gotten on it, it does make me think about what a great coalition building issue this is, yeah. because it doesn't matter if, which thing your organization works on, what you care about, this is something that brings us all together, and we're in a moment where we actually have to bring a vast majority of the public together to get this and everything else done. Yeah. yeah. Other ideas or thoughts? Yeah, I'll go. I mean, one thing I will say, I'm a positive person. I, I have to be. I have a 12-year-old, and, <laughs> and we, we need to make sure that I try to make sure that she can, she can be hopeful about what's ahead of us. And I can tell you on this issue, the folks are way ahead of electeds and the elite conversation that we see out of DC. When you see poll, when you see poll numbers with smart questions, you see majority of the Americans already think expanding the court is a very reasonable proposition. And I actually think young kids, I, I love Gen Z. I mean, one of, they, they are so ahead of things. I think if we don't watch out in 10 years, they may, have, they may actually have radical ideas that goes beyond expansion of Supreme the Court. That's all I'll just say. You know, they, they may ask for abolishing the court. I mean, I, I'm hearing those conversations already. I don't, for me, I, like I said, I'm a, 
I'm a moderate, and my moderate position is expanding the court at this point. <laughs> Um, well, I'm an organizer, so I'm thinking about the things you can do in your neighborhoods, in your groups. Um, you know, form a little discussion group with your book group or your street group or your, uh, if you're a PCO, with your democratic organization and take down that number, which I've already forgotten, 603 something something. Um, 63033. 63033. Um, and have an action at the end of that because I really do think that this is all just building the momentum, you know. And just like I'm dogged about mentioning the filibuster everywhere I go, um, even though it feels kind of wonky, do what Greg said. Link it to whatever issue you're talking about. Stand up and go to your town halls of your Democratic representatives and raise this issue. And that, that's what we just need to get. They've done such a good job. We all have done such a good job of getting the momentum started in the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, its radical nature has helped. But um, now we need to take it to the streets and... Net, where is a better place to do that than Netroots Nation? Absolutely. And, you know, one thing I'll add is I think there is a lot of value in just staying angry at the court. Um, I think it can be really easy to just fall into the term ends, we're pissed off for about a month, and then that anger just kind of turns into apathy where, you know, we're just like, well, I guess this is just the way that it is. But really connecting those issues like we've talked about through the panel um, to those friends of yours, to your family members, to strangers, to be like, do you know what just happened um, in this particular case, especially the cases that aren't as, as high profile. But I think there's, there's value in staying angry because you know, I'm just speculating, but a couple of the cases that came out from the court this term, cases like um, Merrill v. Milligan um, and Moore v. Harper, which were both cases that a lot of advocates, certainly I was expecting the worst of, um, they were touted in the media, and I think that can be a whole other panel as victories. Um, and while they were seemingly victories, it was really like the court preserving the status quo. And I think one can speculate that that preservation comes from this fear, the threat of expansion, the threat that they're, they're seeing um, to reform their institution or this institution. Um, they're like, okay, we'll, we'll deal a couple of huge blows, but maybe on these cases, like, let's keep it a little bit cuter. And so, you know, I think that there's value in staying angry at the court because at the end of the day, they have a reputation. I, I believe that Chief Justice Roberts believes that he wants to have this, this image of the court being upheld um, as one that is progressive in some ways. And so, you know, there's, there's value in staying upset because that's something that I think goes into the factoring of the decisions that they're making as well. I'll also give another call to action. Um, a few of us are actually, many of our organizations are in a coalition. Um, dedicated to expanding the court, and we have a website, formore.us, um, and if you visit that, you can sign up, and we'll make sure that you can also stay involved in this fight um, if you're interested. So in addition to texting... 63033, Six, <laughs> text court. Yes, you can also visit formore.us, um, and we'll make sure that you are um, up to date and, and able to stay involved in this fight. It's really on all of us. It can't be on just some of us to really create the world that we want to live in. And with that, we'll go ahead and start Q&A. Um, I think somebody, Alexa, uh, will come around with the mic to take questions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Betsy Rubin with Indivisible Chicago. I'm completely sold on the idea. You've alluded a little bit to a time frame, but I guess a lot of the pushback that I've gotten has been practical questions. How soon can this actually happen, especially given that we have the filibuster? And what if it happens right before there's a GOP trifecta? And then, then what's the future in that? Thank you. Well, it can't happen in the next year and a half. Okay. So, you know, we'll know whether we have a GOP trifecta or not. And if we have a GOP trifecta, they may do it. I don't know. Um, I'm not convinced that they will, only because, not because I, I totally agree with Merced that they, um, they will do anything they want, but they have so much power already to do the things that they want to do because of the way the Senate is stacked. So, um, so I don't think, I mean, I think I would just say, like, we need to get this ready. You know, we need to get ready for a victory in 2024. Um, that's what we did really well the last time around. And it's because we had an agenda 
in Des the Progressive Caucus put out our agenda in December. We had already been working on that with the Biden-Sanders task forces. And then when January came, we were able to move quickly. And so I think that's, we just need to ready ourselves because, I mean, I'm an optimist, a hopist, whatever you want to call it. Um, if we did get a trifecta and if we got 50 Democratic senators who are willing to overturn the filibuster, there are things that are lined up, but I don't think this has to be far down the line. Like, I think abortion will probably go first, voting rights, you know, I think there's like a, there's a chain of how it would happen. But I think if we did all those things, I think this, we need to get this in the line. Uh, you mentioned there being a sort of legislative line of priorities. Do you think it's possible that this could be in some mega bill the way the IRA just kind of was all the backlog of things we wanted from the EPA and DOE for years and it's just one big bill? It, do you think there's going to be some kind of save democracy bill where it's like, all right, we're going to put the courts and the filibuster and everything and just get it all done at once? Or do you think it's going to be actually a line and we're going to have to go piecemeal on each of these battles? Mm. I haven't thought about that so much, but I don't think it'll be all in one. They're too big. The changes are too big. Um, for the people, which is our get money out of politics bill, um, has a lot of things in it, and there was a lot of pushback to that. Um, and so, you know, whether that stays as even one bill, I don't know. It's just harder, I think. The IRA is a little bit different because it was primarily a climate bill, and then because we got Build Back Better through the House, the Progressive Caucus held the line multiple times. Not that I'm <laughs> proud of the Progressive Caucus. Uh, I just want people to understand that's how it happened, but they had to take a couple of things out of Build Back Better to put into that, and so that's why it ended up that way. So, um, President's already on record as opposing it. Perhaps he's just trying to get past the election. I don't know. But uh, to the two members of Congress, anything we can do to get President Biden to kind of lead or at least begin a conversation on this? Yeah, I mean, we've seen the, the president shift, you know, on filibuster to saying, well, maybe they have to keep talking, uh, which, you know, w would be a huge step, right? But, but you, you know, when you think of amazing filibusters like Wendy Davis's filibuster in Texas, right? She had to stand there for 14 hours um, without going to the bathroom talking uh, to be able to hold up the anti-abortion bill. You know, the president said, maybe we can reform the filibuster to get to that point. I would love to see some Republican senators have to, have to try for a day. And so I think that, uh, I do think that at minimum um, through this election, uh, many of us will continue to advocate for filibuster reform and court expansion so that uh, you know, I think that if we actually had the votes, I would hope that if we actually had the votes, um, that would really mean that we had the vast majority of the country advocating alongside us. And I would, uh, at that point, I, my personal prediction would be that we would have the president to that point. But I do think we have to get into a people lead, politicians follow uh, place on this issue. Um, and I think that if we were to be able to get that to that number of senators, I hope that the president would, would be able to, to pivot to whatever the, the, the small pivot would have to be to get it done. Yeah, and I would, I would also say be in the states that he needs to win um, and make sure he wins in those states. Be in those states, raise the issue, and then make sure he wins. I mean, because I think black voters in Georgia um, and immigrant vo voters in Arizona really helped to get a lot of the agenda solidified because now he understands where his victory comes from. I will, I will also add that this is actually, I think it's a very easy pivot for the president. He, he said this court is not normal. I think that, I believe. That was a and big step. It was a really big step. And I think he can build from that. And a lot of folks came to me, it's like, aren't you upset about it? I'm like, no, I think the, big, the, the easy pivot here is what is this? He, he needs to just run against this CODIS. This CODIS is a super legislature and they are stepping in his way uh, to uh, to enact voting rights. They're stepping in this way to have labor legislation that helps unionization in big Midwestern st states. They're stepping in his way on student loans. They are stepping all over his agenda. And I think he could be a really effective messenger, not just talking about um, how it's thwarting their agenda, but that this court is political. And I think he should also talk about corruption. 
it's, it's a really winning issue for him. And I hope his advisors um, think about that. Thanks, y'all. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the Senate has a lot of agency in this issue. Um, I live here in Illinois. Is it, doesn't my senator have that actual job? What is up with Dick Durbin? <laughs> he's the whip, the actual, like, that's a job. Uh, he's also, he's also chair, chair of the Senate. Judiciary yeah. Committee. Chair of Senate Judiciary. Do you? No, please. <laughs> Look, you have. <laughs> There are some things that advocates should say first. Yeah. <laughs> you have a special opportunity in Illinois to tell Dick Durbin that his job as chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee is not just to confirm nominees. It's a big, important thing. Trump, remember, put 200 judges on the court, uh, on the courts, 85% uh, of them white, 75% of them men. Dick Durbin is doing a tremendously good job at rebalancing the courts. But he also has a second job which is oversight and acting like a co-equal branch of government. And that's his responsibility, so keep telling him. And I'll add, I think that pressure we've seen, even if it's like at a delayed pace, um, that pressure works. Like the outside pressure on politicians, I think yes. even with Dick Durbin, the example of like now him saying we need to have a vote on a piece of ethics legislation that did not, I don't think, can't, I don't think that came from him just waking up one morning and saying, I think we should do this. Um, it's like from people continuing to say, this is ridiculous. What are you going to do about it? These are the things you can do about it, and you should be doing these things. Um, and so, you know, to Brett's point, especially if you're someone who lives in Illinois, um, I think continuing to have that pressure on him, whether it's on issues like nominees, um, but also, and arguably maybe even more importantly, court reform issues as we kind of deal with this existential crisis that is the court um, can be really, really effective. So first of all, as far as pressuring your members of Congress, I just texted uh, the, the Stand Up America thing and I found out my Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi is not yet a sponsor of the Judiciary Act. So if you live in San Francisco, put pressure on her. Um, my question is, since we know Supreme Court expansion isn't gonna happen for at least another year and a half, uh, what about efforts to expand our courts at the Circuit Court, uh, circuit court of Appeals and District Court level? Because vast majority of cases don't even come up to the Supreme Court, and that may be something that's less politically controversial that we can get done now. Yeah. Uh, there's been pieces of legislation to do that, I think, with the Senate uh, and Republican control of the House. That's going to be difficult. They're very happy in the situation that they're in in the courts. Um, one way to work around this might be to phase in expansion over time, make it a job for the next president. Uh, if the Republicans assume they might be able to win the next election, they might not object as strenuously to that kind of bill. Uh, but you're right, the backlog in the district and circuit court levels is extraordinary. Uh, and if you had kept pace with the number of cases, population, we would have a bill like what they did in the Carter administration, which was a massive expansion of both uh, the appellate level and district level. And there's a real push to get rid of the blue slips. I don't know if you want to say. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that you can be pressuring Dick Durbin on, um, he has, as Brett you know, noted, done a really, really good job in rebalancing the courts um, by putting more professionally diverse folks um, on the bench. We've seen, especially recently, folks like Del Ho, Natasha Murrell, Nusrat Chaudhary, um, which will be really exciting additions to the bench. And also, a lot of those additions have been in blue states. Um, we're seeing a lot of the vacancies that are left, which might be close to 100 still, um, taking up mostly the red states with two Republican senators, and as many of us know, those are usually the states where we're seeing the most concerning lit litigation being brought. Um, if folks remember the Mifepristone case that was brought in Texas, um, you know, we have these, these vacancies that need to be filled, and the thing that's stopping them from being filled, I know we're kind of like getting a little sidetracked here, but I feel very passionately about this, um, are the blue slips. And for folks who are not familiar with what blue slips are, um, it's really just a Senate tradition, not even a real rule in the Senate, where it's literally a blue slip. The senator has to sign off to signify their approval of a nominee. And what we've seen, at least during this administration, is a lot of Republican senators using that, shockingly, um, to obstruct and essentially tank really, really qualified nominees. So just a little. It's a, it's a big priority of the Congressional Black Caucus and, yep. and Progressive Caucus is behind it as well and supporting. So, for example, Austin, 10th biggest city in America, one federal judge, because we've just, because Ted Cruz and John Cornyn won't sign off on something, and so then 
Joe Biden and Dick Durbin won't take it up. Hi. Um, in addition to traditional organizing tactics, I've been surprised to find that a lot of my more like white shoe DC firm type friends are starting to talk about Congress's power to like insist that a close read of the Constitution also means that the court isn't guaranteed electricity or isn't guaranteed toilet paper, or, you know, whatever, the internet. Um, I'm wondering, I know these are slightly more theatrical tactics. I know that they don't necessarily have like, you know, a lot of um, political aid, uh, credibility, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are in terms of preventing apathy, keeping this conversation going after the court term ends in um, using slightly more theatrical tactics to keep this in the conversation. I think Democrats and activists should be using every point of leverage they have, every single one. Uh, I think that Senator Van Hollen, who chairs um, the Appropes Subcommittee over in the Senate, uh, offered an amendment this week to cut part of the Supreme Court's budget if they don't institute a code of ethics. Uh, we need to keep doing that kind of thing. Yes, Congress controls the Supreme Court's budget. Congress controls most of the Supreme Court's jurisdiction. Uh, they could take cases away from them. I think we should try everything, have a robust conversation, and keep pushing for reform. I will also add uh, one more thing on that. Uh, you know, you, interesting you mentioned that your colleagues from White Shoe Law Firms, I'm actually hearing the same things as well. Yeah. Pretty much, uh, when I first started taking up uh, advocacy for uh, expanding the court, I, I expected a lot of uh, sort of pushback or amusement from a lot of my former classmates who are at uh, law firms all over the US, they are overwhelmingly supportive and, and they are for, for practical reasons. And so I think there's, an, in terms of pushing, there's, there's opportunity to organize them because a lot of times these electeds are calling on them for fundraising events or whatnot. And that's where they can actually have direct conversations about this and, and, and um, and, and, and essentially confront them directly. What are you going to do about this? And you know, this, this, this conversation should not be confined just at um, in an important place like this, but take it in every venue possible. It's a really key point. And I'm glad that Brett mentioned Senator Van Hollen because he's actually a great organizer on the issues he works on. So you might send him a quick thank you if you get a chance because um, he's really good on this issue and I think he could be a, a, a great ally leader in the in the Senate. I think we have time for one to two more questions. Hi, Nadia Hussein from Moms Rising. I'm also on the National Board of the ACLU. Uh, I wanted to just ask, you know, yes, we can definitely call, like, you know, do the calls to our elected officials as constituents, but, you know, we have a room full of people who work on the back end with our members of Congress, right? Like, the, even if we're not, we're not members ourselves, we we, we, we wordsmith, we do so much work. We have so many relationships with uh, our members of Congress. So what are some back, back end behind, you know, um, tactics that we can do to push from the inside also? Great. I'd love effective? to hear from the members of Congress. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah, there, there, I mean, there's nothing like a really honest conversation with a friend or a really honest conversation with a staff or, you know, at the end of the day, right, like, there, there's no better, stronger predictor of where a member of Congress is going to be on something or an elected official is going to be on something than who it is that they hang out with, who it is they go to dinner with, who it is that they trust. I think that this is the kind of issue where a lot of people's minds are still very open or if they st st like took a position, even in the last six months, there's a d number of my colleagues who have now said like, oh, I may not be on the bill, but I think now after what happened on affirmative action, now after what happened on student debt, I, I have to vote for it. You know, and so I think um, that um, the, the outside organizing is critical, but for those of you, uh, so many of folks at this conference that actually can in person have an honest back and forth conversation um, with uh, policy staffers or members, it, it goes a long way because I do think that, you know, e even I was having conversations with some members of the Senate about why I'm so stridently anti-filibuster. And I think they're listening because times have shifted. Um, and so I, I, I do think that outside pressure has to be paired with some amount of inside strategy. One of the people who I didn't know worked on the back end of my Act Blue account, who I'd never met with before, came and talked with me about an issue that was really important to them that I hadn't talked about, and it informed me a lot. And there was something about the fact that like they happened to work, you know, 
on the back end of the website that we put out a million times and I'd never met them before because they lived in a different city. That, that was meaningful to me. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, we have so many things that come before us. It's really hard to, like, people think that when a bill is introduced, everyone knows that it's introduced, and it's we don't, you know? I mean, sometimes we do. If you're on the Committee of Jurisdiction, you do. If you know the person, you do. And so I do think that... Um, having people just understand you have to raise it is really important. And then also, it's really helpful when somebody is talking about, you mentioned Moms Rising, so, you know, childcare, and then says, you know, what really matters here is the Supreme Court, and you make the tie back to the issue on it, right? And that, I think that's, that's really helpful too. And Greg's right, we don't have a lot of space for honest conversations. Like, Usually what happens is people, and I think we need to do more training, having been an advocate for 20 years on the outside, we need to do more training about how to utilize time in a 15 minute meeting. Mm -hmm. Because I get a lot of people who come in and they're fabulous and they're telling me all the reasons I should support immigration reform. <laughs> and I'm like, I mean, I've got those bills, right? So let's have a strategy conversation about what you can do and what I can do and what we what we need to help each other with. And I think you're uniquely positioned if you're on the back end in those conversations to sort of have those more strategic conversations where perhaps the guard is let down a little bit and it's not like I'm just going to check the box that says I had a, a meeting with my member so that the organization can say we had 54 meetings, but I'm actually going to have a strategic conversation and we didn't have a lot of organizers. I mean, you have this amazing organizer from Texas who made stuff happen in Austin. Amazing organizers that you heard on stage today. You know, we are interested in partnering to figure out what a strategy is. And sometimes I feel like those meetings are like, tell us that you support these things. You already know I support them. I'm already on the bill. So let's use our time differently. And so I think you could be helpful with that too. I think we can squeeze in one more question. Hi, all. Thank you so much for being here. This has been great. Um, as we've uh, t touched on a little bit, I think, like, there's there's no way of really talking about the court without talking about the Senate. And with the proportional representation for every state in the Senate, at every year that goes by, the it becomes a less democratic institution. Uh, now I think it's California has less than 180th per person representation to Wyoming, it'll probably cross 100 in a lifetime of everybody in here, and it's only becoming less and less democratic. And so how, how do you think we should fix that? Obviously, it's hard because of the Constitution, but I mean, there's a crisis that we're heading towards of whether this country stays democratic just because of the equal pro the representation there. How do you propose we deal with that? Thank you very much. I mean, at a minimum, we make DC a state. I've said multiple times that if um, that if uh, if the Republicans thought that DC was a Republican city, we would already have North and South DC as states. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm, I'm serious. Like if people laugh, but I'm like, no, that would have happened. And so I think we have to at, at minimum get folks the representation that they they deserve. Secondly, a voter suppression tactic we don't talk enough about is literally the millions of immigrants who are, in my view, totally just our citizens. We just, ha they just have not been formally conferred or their citizenship recognized by the United States Congress. So there's some of those starting points we have to get to. But yeah, abolishing the Electoral College and then f and figuring out what it is that we do about the disproportionate um, misrepresentation in the Senate is a, is a huge challenge. I, I, you know, I'm open to uh, you know, learning more and talking with folks about what it is that we could do. But at a minimum, there's just those starting points of, re of enfranchising immigrants as, as citizens and, and D.C. statehood and the rest. Yeah. yeah, I think that's right. Because because part of it is like, where do you have the most momentum to make the most changes as quickly as possible? And so I think the Electoral College is unfortunately going to take us a little longer. Um, and the makeup of the Senate is going to take us a little bit longer. It doesn't mean it's off the table. It's just like, how do we, how do we phase this and think about this as, say, a, a five- or a ten-year campaign with, with two-year 
um, phases in each of, you know, in that 10 years, right? Like, what do we want to get done first? What do we want to get done second? And those things might change. Like, you need to have flexibility when you're running any long campaign that maybe something suddenly catches hold and it moves up earlier. But we do have to be focused on, <laughs> I know when we did our agenda um, right before Biden, President Biden came in and we won back the 117th, con yeah, 17th Congress, um, our initial list for the Progressive Caucus was like 120 things, priorities. And we were able to get it down to five. I would have liked to get it down to three, but that was really impossible. But you know, we've just gotta be really focused and have a democratic process so everyone kind of stays with it because it's just, there's a lot. There's a lot we need to do to fix this country. And it just gives me hope that you all are here doing that work. Yeah, and, you know, like Brett mentioned earlier, I think there are other reforms that, you know, aren't as much in the conversation at this point, but that could very well, I think, as or if this court continues to become uh, more and more undemocratic, um, that we can and probably should explore, whether that's taking jurisdiction away from the court in certain cases, whether that's, like, redirecting particular cases to different jurisdictions, um, or even like thinking about the role that Congress can play in reviewing some of these actions of the court after they come out with decisions to see if there's a way that we can make it more democratic, especially when it's dealing with the court striking down things that have legislative authority. Um, so would be happy to talk more about that. We are out of time, but I wanna just say thank you, first of all, to all of you. <laughs> Um, I know it is Saturday afternoon, so we really, really appreciate y'all sticking with us, but please give a round of applause for our panelists, too. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of Netroots.